guess that I always sort of knew that microbes populate the air, the water, the soil of our planet. What I didn't know was how important they were. They're a key part of every ecosystem, and they also benefit humans when they enter our body. Some are pathogens, but many others actually keep us healthy. The human body contains more bacteria cells than human cells. That came as a shock to me. And were we to disappear from the planet, life would continue. But if the microbes disappear, everything comes to a halt. Our microbial expert is Chris Suttle. Okay, so um, uh, what a pleasure. Isn't this great? You know, so I, I was sitting here this morning and listening to everybody and thinking, God, all these people are crazy. And then I was wondering, why did they invite me? So, and, so uh, um, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try and convince you that uh, I guess that uh, microbes rule the world. We heard that, in fact, that uh, there are more microbial cells in our body, about 10 times more than there are human cells. Uh, you're actually carrying around five to 10 kilos of bacteria right now. <laughs> what I want to have you think about today then is about this whole idea of, of microbes and their role on the planet. So the world is microbial. Now this thing ties together some interesting thoughts. The planet is largely water. It's about 71% of the surface of the earth is the oceans. And then we add the lakes on top of that. So we're, we're living in a watery, watery world. And I'm going to tell you today about some vignettes, uh, about, primarily about what microbes do in oceans. So to start off, what is a microbe? Well, a microbe is a whole series of organisms, which are microscopic, hence the name microbial, or microbe. And some of them are, are little single-celled organisms that swim around. These would be called proteas. And we've got things like these are bacteria, and we have viruses. So those are the, the three things that I'm going to talk about a little bit today. And I'll, I'll give a little bit more of a a background in terms of exactly what I mean when we're talking about microbes. This is called the big tree of life, right? So as biologists, all the living organisms, basically, we can, we can put on this, on this big tree. And so what this is like a family tree. So everything from a bacterium to ourselves carries some of the same genetic information. And so if we look at it, this big tree, so all the living organisms we can kind of put on that tree. So if we take a look at it, uh, up there, you see on the upper left-hand side, well, that's the bacteria. So you can see there's a branch up here that contains all the bacteria, basically, right? So then we have another branch of things that are quite distantly related, which everybody thought were bacteria until about 20, 30 years ago, which are called archaea, which, again, they look like bacteria. Some of them are really cool, though. Like some of them, how many organisms do you know that are a square, right? So, so uh, there's another group of organisms up there, and then, and then down here we have... Proteas, which are these other little single-celled things, they swim around, and etc. Well, so if you look at that, you might sort of wonder, well, I'm an organism too, or, or there's other, or what about all these things I'm familiar with, the things that I know, right? I don't see that. Well, of course, so, so higher organisms we want to talk about, right? So what about some higher organisms? Okay, well, here's a, a higher organism, a mushroom. Right? So that's something that we're all familiar with. In fact, I saw this same mushroom in, in that earlier talk. That's Amanites muscara. That's one of the things if you eat, it'll kill you, right? So, uh, so that's not the mushroom you want. But then you say, well, well, that's okay. That's sort of a higher organism. Well, where am I? So, well, in fact, I'll show you where I am. And, well, I'm right there. So this, so this is, if you look at our family tree then, and the big family tree of life, I mean, basically, you know, our closest relative is a mushroom. So if we look at that, well, what about viruses? I forgot viruses in that tree. Well, viruses, we heard a little bit of information about viruses already today. And viruses are a bit different because they're obligate pathogens. They don't have metabolism on their own. They have to actually infect something in order to, to have functional metabolism. Now, that's actually starting to change as well as, as this gap kind of closes. But basically, that's, that's how you would di differentiate between these. Well, viruses... They're so genetically different, we can't even put them on the same tree. Okay, so their genetic variation is so distinct, we have to look at them independently. They have different ways of encoding their genetic information and expressing their genetic information. They still use nucleic acids. They don't all use DNA. A large number of them use RNA, which is 
is copied off of DNA and, and DNA, which is copied off an RNA and a bunch of things. They still use nucleic acids. Some of them use the same nucleic acids as we do, but they're genetically extremely different again. So if we consider all of those things as microbes then, then let's we think about, well, how many people recognize that? Yeah, Jamie Matthews there, he'd recognize that, right? So, so of course, you'd, you know, this is a, a picture from the Hel Hubble telescope after it's got its glasses, right? So, and, um, and everybody, see, you know, every time they find a little something blinking out there once in a while, there's a new planet going around a star, right? It's the front page of the New York Times. I don't know. Somehow, that looks a lot like the stuff that we see, except there's no false color in what we look at. So this is what we look at when we look through a microscope. This is a drop of water. And in this drop of water, that's stained with a, a fluorescent dye, which stains the nucleic acids. And these little guys here, those are bacteria. And then these other little, little guys there are viruses. So that's what it looks like. You take a little drop of, of water and take a look at it. That's kind of what it looks like overall. But what was amazing is about 20 years ago, when people started looking at that on average, there's about 5 million bacteria and about 250 million viruses in every teaspoon of seawater. And it's the same in lake water. And so one thing to think about is every time you go swimming, <laughs> you swallow about as many viruses as there are people on the earth. With all these viruses, you know, what if you took them all and you stretched them end to end? How far would they go? So I, I took a conservative estimate and said there's about a million viruses per mil in seawater, so that's a, a big underestimate. And I multiplied that by the volume of the oceans, which I happen to know, so, so that came out to be about 10 to the 30th viruses. So I said, well, and each virus is about 100 nanometers long, right? So that's pretty small. So multiplied it by that, and so that came out to be about 10 to the 23 meters, and that's still a big number. That's larger than the U.S. deficit even. So, so I thought, well... So let's try and put those together again, and let's just divide by 10 to the 20th kilometers. That's a long ways, right? Oh, let's just divide by light years, right? So get it over with. Divide by 10 to the 13th kilometers, and it goes 10 to the 7th light years, right? If you stretched all these little viruses end to end. So, well, our nearest star is Proxima Centauri, about 4.2 light years away. The Crab Supernova is about 4,000 light years away. The Milky Way galaxy is about 150,000 light years across. In fact, if you took these viruses and stretched them out from Earth and did a, you know, a big radius, they would encompass the nearest 40 galaxies or so. But what the point that I want to make is that it's those prokaryotes and those viruses out there which are actually setting the stage so that we're alive at all. I want to go now and talk a little bit about carbon. So we're familiar with this picture, at least Many of us are. So this is the buildup of CO2, carbon dioxide concentration versus time, as measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So this is what everybody's concerned about. This is the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, and so what do microbes have to do with that? Well, let's take a look at, at sort, of the planetary, uh, uh, sort of the planetary carbon cycle and where that CO2 is coming from that's going into the atmosphere. Well, we've got about seven teratons of carbon, roughly, tied up as fossil fuels that we haven't burned yet and converted to CO2 that we're just ready to do, right? So if you look at um, other, other reservoirs, the atmosphere, this says 805 gigatons, but in fact, it's probably closer to 820 gigatons now. It's a, it's a little bit older, this number. So we've got uh, that in the atmosphere, so a pretty small number relative to what's in fossil fuels. But if you look at the ocean, that completely dwarfs everything else, right? So in the oceans, we've got about 38 teratons of carbon just floating around in the ocean, primarily as CO2 and bicarbonate. So that's where most of the CO2 is, right? If you look at the fluxes, so we're producing about two gigatons a year through deforestation, and about five gigatons per year as a result of burning fossil fuels. So about seven gigatons per year of carbon we're pumping into the atmosphere. If you want to look at what comes out of the ocean annually, it's about 90 gigatons. So 10 times as much just comes out of the ocean, right? As a result of diffusion and gases coming in. We just happen to be lucky that about 93 gigatons per year goes into the ocean. 
Now, these are really hard numbers to measure, but I think it's pretty apparent that any small changes in those fluxes is going to have an enormous effect, potentially, on how much is in the atmosphere. I mean, because it's, the fluxes are 10 times as high as we're producing from all of our fossil fuel burning. And the interesting thing is, is that so you can see anything that upsets that balance can have a huge effect. And in some parts of the ocean now appear to be producing CO2, which we're absorbing CO2. We really don't understand what's going on there. The point there, then, is that these microbes are, in, in essence, controlling all these chemical fluxes. They're the ones that are, if you look at photosynthesis, for example, so that's where our, our oxygen comes from, about half of the photosynthesis that's going on in the planet is going on in the ocean. And that's all done by microbes, in essence. And just to finish off with one idea, I want to leave you with this idea about uh, how much do we know. Well, this is a project that we did that we decided to go out and look at the viruses using high-throughput sequencing technology that we just heard about in the Arctic Ocean and British Columbia and the Gulf of Mexico and uh, the Sargasso Sea off here in the Atlantic, and just asked the question about what do we know about the viruses in this system. So we went out there and sequenced uh, about 1.8 million sequences, and then you can compare that against the amount of genetic information that we know, and, and you can imagine how much that is, how much genetic information we're accumulating every day with this high-throughput sequencing technology. And it turns out that on average, more than 90% of the sequences, the DNA sequences that we pulled out, had no recognizable similarity to anything which was in any genetic databases. And so what that means is, remember what we just heard in the last talk, is each one of those genes encodes for a specific protein. In many cases, those proteins are involved in a biochemical reaction, whether it's photosynthesis or respiration or whatever it is that makes us run as organisms. So that means we don't know anything about what any of these guys are doing or even capable of. And in fact, recently there's been whole new biochemical pathways that have been uncovered but we're just barely scratching the surface. So the bottom line is the world's microbial. Um, I want to leave you with a few ideas. Certainly we exist because of the microbes that are out there. Microbes created and maintain the atmosphere that we have. They cause diseases, but in fact, the reasons that we don't have diseases is largely because of the of the microbiota that are associated with us. Believe me, if we didn't carry around 10 kilograms of bacteria, we'd be susceptible to all those nasty pathogens and they'd be colonizing us and we'd be dead. Um, they house almost all of the genetic diversity on the Earth. So the amount of genetic diversity that's encompassed in us higher organisms is just a tiny fraction of the amount of genetic information that's out there. And yet we know almost nothing about what these organisms do, and how they maintain this balance on the planet. And, and ultimately, you, you look at these mass extinctions that have occurred in the past, there's no reason that they can't happen again. And so, some of these things are under human control, some of these things are not, but it's certainly good to be aware of it and to try and do the best that we can in terms of understanding what's going on and then make personal decisions. Because this is not a scientific problem, this is a social problem, right? In terms of, of how we live our life and, and, and how we deal with these things. Thanks very much.